Let's begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you are a holy God, and we are awed in your presence. As we come here, we desire to open our ears to hear your word, and we pray that you would help us to grow in our understanding of your will for our lives, and also our appreciation for the character of Christ. Lord, we desire to, to be in love with Jesus, and we desire to follow him very closely and not at a distance. And so we pray that this sermon, this message today would help us to follow Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. amen. So the sermon title today is Obedience to Christ in an Age of Rebellion. In the last few months, we have seen rebellion in different forms. Let me just name a few examples. We've seen some social activists rebelling against the police because of their unjust use of force. We have seen some Christians rebelling against the government's COVID-19 restrictions because they felt that these restrictions impinged upon their religious freedom. We live at a time when mistrust towards the government is really at an all-time high. People have deep grievances against the government. Some of it is the result of an abuse of power. Some of it is the result of misinformation. Some, some see injustice where there is injustice, and some believe there is injustice where there is none. So how should we respond to this tense and potentially explosive situation as Christians? Should we take part in rebelling against the government's authority because it is unjust or because we perceive it to be unjust? I'm not talking about protesting. I'm talking about disobeying the law or simply ignoring the law. We need to start off by affirming a core biblical principle. The core principle is that the gospel should be the source of our ethics. Our understanding of what is right and wrong comes from Christ's practice of the law of God, not our own interpretation of the law of God. In other words, we must be willing to relinquish our own ideas of what the law teaches for Christ's ideas when there is a conflict between the two. Our ethics must come from the law as it is interpreted by Christ. Now, we see this gospel principle of emulating Christ expressed in many places in the New Testament. Let me mention just a few of them in order to set us on the right track. Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Then in Matthew 5, he goes on to say several times, You have heard that it was said to those of old. In other words, the traditions that people had. But I say to you, John chapter 15, 10. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. And then finally, Romans 10, 4. For they, speaking about the Jews, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end or the goal of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now let me sum up what the Bible teaches in these texts and other texts. It teaches us that Christ is the perfect embodiment of God's will for our lives. The perfect embodiment. We are to follow his example of obedience to God's law. And in so doing, we fulfill God's will for our lives. This is an incredibly important principle for us to remember in the heated debates of our time. What would Jesus do is the question we need to ask. We are not to allow our love of freedom and patriotism or our commitment to social justice to be our guiding principles. Christ's life and teachings should be our guiding principle. We should study his perfect life to make sure we are following what he taught. 
and what he practiced. And we should be willing to lay aside our own ideas and ways when they contradict Christ's way. Today I hear many Christians thinking as patriots first and Christians last. Their religion is more about preserving their freedoms than following the will of Christ. This should not be the case if we are truly following Jesus. Paul gives his mentee and co-worker, Timothy, some advice that is necessary for us to heed as well. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3, Paul said this. He said, As I urged you when I went to Macedonia, remain in Ephesus, that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And then verse 9 and 10. Contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. The main topic in Paul's two letters to Timothy is that we should teach, believe, and do nothing other than what is consistent with the gospel of Christ. The goal of the gospel is love from a pure heart, from a good conscience, and from a sincere faith. The gospel is to be our standard of right and wrong, and we are not to depart from this faith. We are to strive to be consistent with the gospel in all things. In 2 Timothy 2.15, Paul says, We are to study to show ourselves approved by the gospel. In other words, we are to make sure our lives and ideas measure up to the standard of the gospel. Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, 3 through 6, If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which accords with godliness, he is proud. And then he goes on. It can be difficult at times to know who is on the right side of an issue when there are differing opinions. But Paul says that we can know what is right by going back to the words of Jesus Christ and finding out what he taught us. Christ is always on the right side of an issue, and everything that departs from his life and his words is destitute of the truth and is the source of division and strife. So he goes on to say this, right? So he's proud somebody who departs from what Christ teaches, knowing nothing but is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words. So Paul is calling us to make Christ's life and teachings the source of our thinking and understanding about every issue. But you know, this is easier said than done. In fact, Paul warns us both in 1 and 2 Timothy that there will be a falling away from the gospel truth in latter times. In other words, there will be a rebellion of sorts. Paul says that this will lead to dangerous times. You can read about it in 1 Timothy 4, 1-2. Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. We read about it also in 2 Timothy 3, 1-7. through But know this, that in the last days, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves. Lovers of money, boasters, proud, and, and he just goes on. When I read Paul's description of the last days, I must conclude from what he says that it will not be easy to stay faithful to the gospel of Christ in the last days because Satan is working invisibly to lead Christians astray from the example of Christ. Satan is leading Christians to love themselves first. Now, how does he do this? <laughs> 
Well, he does this by introducing doctrines and concepts and ideas into our minds that are intended to prevent us from seeing the truth of the gospel and obeying it. Satan uses whatever works to mislead. He uses theological ideas. He uses the media. He uses ideas from pop culture, political slogans, philosophical premises, ethical ideas. Whatever will pull us away from Christ, whatever will cause us to put ourselves first. And he uses these ideas to burn our consciences so that we will think and act contrary to the will of God. In American culture, for example, the idea of freedom has really been sometimes sucked of its God-given meaning. Freedom is described as maximal self-assertion. But in the gospel, freedom is found in self-restraint. That is why the Apostle James calls God's law the law of liberty. Freedom is found in obedience to God's law. When the Jews were freed from the oppressive regime of Pharaoh, they were immediately led by God to Mount Sinai in order to learn how to keep this newfound freedom. Freedom from oppression is sustained and preserved by freedom, by, by self-restraint. Freedom is unraveled by a lack of self-restraint. So Paul's expose of Satan's tactics to deceive the church should cause us to stay close to Christ's words and life in order that we might discern error and reject it before it turns us aside from the gospel truth. Now, having established the core biblical principle that the gospel of Jesus Christ should be the source of our ethics, we can move forward to answer the question that we are looking at today. How should we as Christians respond to the tense situation our nation is going through right now? Should we take part in rebelling against the government's COVID-19 laws or the police because they are unjust or because we perceive them to be unjust? Now, let's start with what Jesus said about the Roman law and how his contemporaries should respond to Roman authority. The Romans were foreign invaders who ruled with an iron grip, often using violence and draconian measures, such as crucifying many people at the same time to breed fear into the people. If you open with me to Matthew chapter 22, verse 15 to 22, Jesus talks about an appropriate um, response and attitude towards, towards the law. So then the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God in truth. Nor do you care about anyone, for you do not regard the person of men. Tell us, therefore, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the tax money. So they brought him a denarius. And he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. When they had heard these words, they marveled and left him and went their way. So in these words, Jesus encouraged people to obey the Roman law. He said, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, and render to God what is God's. Let's look at another text where Jesus talks about obedience to the Romans. In this next verse, he shows us to what extent we should obey and submit to authority. You know, how far should we go in that? Read with me Matthew 5.41. So Matthew 5.41. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Now what was Jesus referring to in this verse? Occasions of irritation to the Jews were constantly arising from their contact with the Roman army. Detachments of troops were stationed at different points throughout Judea and Galilee, and their presence reminded the people of their own degradation as a nation. 
With bitterness of soul, they heard the loud blast of the trumpet and saw the troops forming around the standard of Rome and bowing in homage to the symbol of her power. Conflicts between the people and the soldiers were frequent, and these conflicts inflamed popular hatred. Often as some Roman official with his guard of soldiers hastened from point to point, he would seize the Jewish peasants who were laboring in the field and compel them to carry burdens upon the mountainside or render other services that might be needed. This was in accordance with Roman law and custom. And resistance to such demands only called forth taunts and cruelty. Every day deepened in the hearts of the people the longing to cast off the Roman yoke. Especially among the bold, rough-handed Galileans, the spirit of insurrection was ripe. Capernaum, being a border town, was the seat of the Roman garrison. And even while Jesus was teaching, the sight of a company of soldiers recalled to his hearers the bitter thought of Israel's humiliation. The people looked eagerly to Christ, hoping that he was the one who would humble the pride of Rome. With sadness, Jesus looked into the upturned faces before him. He noted the spirit of revenge they had stamped in their face. He knew how bitterly the people longed for power to crush their oppressors. And so mournfully, he bid them, resist not him that is evil. But whoever slaps you on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with him two. Now Christ clearly taught obedience to governmental authority, even when the government's demands were unjust or overbearing. Jesus instructed his disciples not to resist the demands of the government, but to do even more than was required of them, to go the extra mile. Wow! I mean, Jesus was advocating a radical form of obedience to government authority that went way beyond civic duty, beyond what most people would consider reasonable. He asked his disciples to embrace a servant-like attitude. Now this begs the question, why did Jesus advocate this form of radical obedience, even to the unjust governments and unjust requirements? To answer this question, we must go to an earlier section of the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew 5.14, Jesus answers this question. Matthew 5.14, Jesus said to his audience, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house, lest your light so shine before me that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So you see here, his disciples were called to bring a form of knowledge to the world that the world lacked. The Romans did not know the love of God. The disciples had the enormous privilege of revealing God's character of love to a lost world. And one way in which the Romans would come to know God's love was through Jesus' disciples' obedience and compliance to their unjust authority. In Matthew 5.45, Jesus said, But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so. Therefore, you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect." So Jesus taught radical obedience even towards unjust laws and rulers because he and his disciples were called to show God's goodness, patience, love towards evil people in a redemptive way. By reacting kindly to those who treat them with injustice and oppression, they boldly declared God's amazing love 
and they invited people to repent. Now, what's interesting is that Jesus taught the same radical obedience and respect towards unjust religious authorities. In Matthew 23, verses 1 through 5, we read, Then Jesus spoke to the multitudes and his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, that observe and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and do not do. For they bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. But all their words they do, all their works they do to be seen by men. They make their phylacteries broad and enlarge the borders of their garments. So Jesus' critique of the Pharisees was quite extensive. It didn't stop with verse 5. He goes on to describe their pride, their hypocrisy, and their murderous intentions. But despite his critique of the religious authorities, he still bid his disciples and the multitude to obey them because of their position as leaders. So not only did Jesus teach radical obedience to the authorities, even unjust authorities, but we're going to see that he also lived that himself. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he allowed himself to be arrested by the unjust authorities, even though he had the power to resist them. In fact, he manifested this power in a most spectacular fashion. We read about this in John 18, 4 through 7. You see, when the detachment of troops and officers came from the high priest with lanterns and torches and weapons, he asked them who they were seeking for. And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus identified himself as the person they were looking for. And at that very moment, verse 6 tells us that they drew back and they fell to the ground. So he used his divine power to throw them backwards. This gave them the opportunity to reflect over their plans and back off from his arrest. Jesus asked them a second time, who they were seeking. Jesus again identified himself as the one they were looking for. But this time, he didn't use his power to stop them in their tracks, even though he could have. He could have used his power to resist their wicked and unjust arrest of him, much like Elijah did when King Isaiah sent the soldiers to arrest him in 2 Kings. But instead, he submitted to them and allowed them to bind him. Later, Paul described Jesus as being obedient even to the death of the cross. So we have observed how Jesus taught his disciples the philosophy of obedience to governmental authority, even when that authority is unjust and illegitimate. We have observed how Jesus lived out this obedience himself. We have seen how he based this radical obedience on the idea that God's people were called to reveal the radically good character of God to the world. Jesus was unambiguous in his message of radical obedience, and his disciples got the point. They continued teaching this message of submission to government authorities, even when Jesus was taken to heaven. In fact, Peter writes about this in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Starting with verse 11, he says, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts, which war against the soul, having your conduct honorably amongst the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Therefore, submit yourself to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the kings as supreme or to the governors, as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Notice how Peter explained the purpose of this radical obedience to the government in much the same way Jesus explained it. The church was called to be servants of God and bring glory to him 
and to silence their critics. So far, we've looked at Christ's example regarding radical obedience to government authority. But there is another side of Jesus. And in order to have a correct picture of Jesus, we need to see that Christ was not always obedient to the authorities. In fact, we find many instances in the Gospels where Jesus was radically disobedient to the religious authorities. These instances of radical disobedience were just as much a part of Jesus' life and philosophy as his teaching and practice of radical obedience to the governing authorities. In Mark 7, for example, Jesus and the disciples ate bread with unwashed hands. This action was an act of disobedience to the laws of the Pharisees. In verse 2 and 3, Mark tells us that the Pharisees found fault with him because the Pharisees and all Jews did not eat unless they washed their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. Another example, in Mark 2, 23-28, Jesus and his disciples went through grain fields on the Sabbath. And as they went, his disciples began to pluck the heads of the grain. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to Jesus, Look, why do they do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? You see, Jesus disobeyed the traditions of the Pharisees by allowing his disciples to pluck and eat grain for their nourishment as they ministered to God's people on the Sabbath. He explained his actions from the Holy Scriptures. He showed that the Scriptures justified their plucking grain for their nourishment. Another and final example, in Mark 3, 1 through 6, Jesus disobeyed the religious authorities, this time by healing on the Sabbath day while worshiping in the synagogue. He asked the people, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? So here we have just a few examples of Christ's disobedience to the religious authorities. But there are many more. The Bible records a total of seven times that Christ healed on the Sabbath against the rules of the authorities. Now let's take a step back. How are we to understand Christ's life and teachings in regard to obedience? On the one hand, he taught and lived radical obedience to the authorities. On the other hand, he, radically, he was radically disobedient at times. How are we to make sense of this apparent contradiction? Well, the answer is simple. There is no contradiction. Jesus obeyed the authorities, even when their laws and requirements were unjust. He accepted bad things done to him by the authorities. But he never disobeyed or sorry, he never obeyed the dictates of the government when they forced him to do something that was bad. He disobeyed the authorities when their laws and rules required him to do something which contradicted the laws given by God. His heavenly Father's authority was higher to him than the authority of the Pharisees and the priests. He obeyed God rather than man when God's requirements diverged from man's requirements. Remember, Jesus taught his disciples and the multitudes that they were to obey the religious leaders insofar as they sat in Moses' seat and taught people to follow Moses. But they were not to follow the religious authorities and what they did because in reality they didn't practice the law of God. Jesus had come to fulfill the law of God to show forth its true meaning. And he did so by holding fastidiously to the law's original meaning, no matter what the authorities said it meant. He was faithful to God's requirements. He lived a sinless, spotless life. And his faithfulness to God cost him a great deal. His obedience to God brought him in conflict with the sinful requirements of society. Eventually, this was one of the main reasons why he was put to death by the authorities. And so he was obedient to the Father, even to the death of the cross. Now, after Pentecost, the disciples continued the work of Jesus by preaching and healing. And they also refused to obey the priest when they were asked to stop preaching and doing, not doing what God had commanded them to do. 
They said we ought to obey God rather than man, thereby citing Christ's principle that God's law was above the law of man. Now, I think it's just interesting that in 1862, Ellen White, um, he was one of my beloved authors, wrote to the church these words. This was during the time of slavery. She said, when the laws of men conflict with the word and law of God, we are to obey the latter, whatever the consequences may be. The law of our land requiring us to deliver a slave to his master, we are not to obey. And we must abide the consequences of violating this law. The slave is not the property of any man. God is his rightful master, and man has no right to take God's workmanship into his hands and claim him as his own. She was quite far ahead of her time. Now let's apply the life and teachings of Christ to the issues of our time. That's where the rubber hits the road. So you see, Christ taught us that we should obey the governing authorities as long as the requirements do not require us to do something contrary to the law of God. We should obey them even if the laws are overly strict or unfair or intrusive. We should obey the laws even if they limit our legitimate freedom and rights. Now with this understanding of Christ's life and teaching in mind, I believe we should obey the COVID-19 requirements. We should obey these requirements out of obedience to Christ. We may feel like they're unfair, overly restricted, and intrusive, but we should obey them nevertheless in obedience to Christ. Unless, of course, the laws require us to do something that is contrary to the law of God. Now, this is where it gets specific. So what about the governor's request before that we not meet as a church because of COVID-19? Should we obey that law or should we disobey it? Doesn't the Bible say, do not forsake the gathering of yourselves together, but exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, Hebrews 10.25. Wouldn't we be disobeying the word of God by not meeting? Now, I would argue that we should obey the governor, even when she asked the church not to meet. And let me explain. You see, God's health laws in Leviticus can help us understand this issue clearer. God instructed his people to quarantine individuals who were either susceptible to illness or who had a sickness which was contagious. For example, mothers who had just given birth were not allowed to go to the temple to worship with other believers for a prescribed period of time. This protected them from illness. There were other laws which dictated that people with certain contagious illnesses were to stay out of the camp for a prescribed period of time in order not to pass on their illness to others. In Matthew 8, verses 1 through 4, when Jesus healed the leper, he requested that the healed man go to the priest's and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. By sending the man to the priest, Jesus honored and respected the health laws that God had set up. He recognized the priest as the gatekeepers. They were the doctors. They were given discretion by God's law over whether a person should return to society or not. Now, it's important to see that Christ recognized the legitimacy of these quarantine laws. He respected them. He showed his high regard for them while on earth and thereby confirmed their legitimacy. Now, the exact nature of these requirements is not as important to us as the fact that these kinds of restrictions were prescribed and that Christ honored and respect, respected them. These health laws were geared to the specific health needs of Israel at the time. We, however, encounter new illnesses and new health issues and must apply these laws and principles to our modern needs. So my conclusion based upon God's health laws is that so long as the government's restrictions are motivated by health concerns, they are legitimate and should be followed. But if the government imposes restrictions upon religious meetings without health concerns, without the, with the intention of restricting the free exercise of religion, 
they are illegitimate and should be opposed because they contradict the law of God. The government's motivation is the deciding factor. In China, for example, where the government is actively opposing Christian worship and witness, the church must obey God rather than man and face the consequences, even if that means death. But here in the U.S., the issue is different. I believe we can, with good conscience, obey COVID-19 restrictions, and we should do so out of love for our neighbor. We want to protect our neighbors, our families. We want them to stay healthy. Now, knowing what we are to obey, knowing that we are to obey the laws of the land is just as important as knowing when we are not to obey them. There will come a time when America will force people to worship the beast. Revelation 13 describes this future day. The issue will be over the law of God. But we're not yet there. Although we are approaching that day, However, I believe that our example of obedience to the government today is important at a time when there's growing anarchy and chaos. When we have to stand trial for our conscientious obedience to the laws of God at the end, when Sunday observance is enforced and we insist on Sabbath observance, will they be able to look at our lives and see that we have been law-abiding, and supportive of the government? Or will they look at our lives and find a spirit of rebellion and independence? When Christ stood before the religious leaders and the political leaders of his time, they could find nothing to accuse him of. Nothing. That wasn't made up. Will they be able to say the same about you and me? Or will our social media posts and our actions give them reason to accuse us? Now, my time is up, but I just want to mention that it goes without saying that Jesus would never have lent his support to resisting arrest or destroying people's property or hurting individuals for the sake of correcting injustice and societal ills. He never did any of these things, so we can't get involved in such activism. Now, let me draw it to a close. The example and teachings of Christ are everything to us. In answering how we should respond to contemporary problems, we need to always return to the example of Jesus. We need to study how he followed the law of God. As Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Christ is our power, our wisdom, our righteousness, our sanctification, and redemption. We possess everything we need in Christ to live godly lives in this world. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he writes that babes in Christ follow other people they say, I follow this person, or I follow that person. Paul says they're carnal. Instead, Paul's us, Paul calls us to be spiritual sons and daughters of God by following Christ, who is God's foundation. So what distinguishes God's people from the world? It's obedience to Christ. And so let us grow up into spiritual maturity through the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature and the fullness of Christ, and not be like babes who are tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine. Let us be obedient to Christ in order that we might escape this rebellious world. Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Lord, we are standing indeed at tumultuous and momentous at times, things are happening at a very fast pace, and we want to stay at your side and not be washed away by what we watch, by what we listen to, by what we hear, but help us to be fully grounded in Jesus, to be rooted and grounded in his love and in his obedience. And I pray for the Holy Spirit to fill each one of us, Lord. Thank you for this time together. May you give us the courage to be humble, and to have the Spirit of Jesus. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.